Can I welcome members to the 12th meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, we've got apologies uh, from Alison Harris. Uh, Bill Bowman is substituting for her and Neil Finlay. Um, can I welcome Dr. Andrew Simpson, Dr. Eleanor Russell and David Wedderburn to the meeting. Um, now, before the evidence session begins, there's one piece of business the committee must decide first, and that's a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed that we take items five, six, seven, and eight in private, um, and those are well, items five and six are the delegated powers provisions in the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill and the Social Security Scotland Bill, both as amended at stage two. Item seven uh, is the relevant recent developments in relation to the European Withdrawal Bill. Item eight is the third quarterly report on instruments considered this parliamentary year. Uh, and then, of course, we've got item nine, which is consideration of the evidence we're about to hear. So does, does the committee agree to take those items in private? Okay. So we'll move on to agenda item two, which is the Prescription Scotland Bill, um, stage one evidence. Uh, it's the third of our evidence sessions on the bill. So we have before us today Dr. Andrew Simpson, senior lecturer uh, at the School of Law at the University of Aberdeen. Dr. Eleanor Russell, senior lecturer in law at Glasgow Caledonian University. And David Wedderburn, who is described as a forensic architect. Um, I'd, I'd quite like to know what a forensic architect is. I'm dual qualified. I have a, a, a degree in architecture from Aberdeen and a law degree from Edinburgh and a master's from Strathclyde in construction law. Right, okay. <laughs> and you're from the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland. So welcome uh, to you all. Um, so we'll um, open the evidence session. We've got a number of uh, questions to get through. Um, I'll start off. Um, uh, probably Dr. Simpson and Dr. Russell, but um, don't all feel you have to answer all the questions. Um, if you want to say something, just, just indicate that you do. Um, so the first question we've got, um, under the 1973 Act, five-year prescription applies to those obligations on one statutory list and not to those obligations on a second statutory list. Sections 1 to 3 of the bill would extend the scope of the obligations covered by five-year prescription. In particular, Section 3 of the bill would extend five-year prescription to all statutory obligations to pay money. So do you agree with the general rule in Section 3 of the bill applying five-year prescription to statutory obligations to pay money? And do you agree with the exceptions to that general rule set out in Section 3 of the bill? Who wants to go first? Right, Dr. I'm, Russell. I'm happy to go first. Okay. Yes, um, the short negative prescription, as you've just explained, applies only to obligations set out in Schedule 1, Paragraph 1 of the 1973 Act. And that list is exhaustive. If a particular obligation is not stated on that list, then the short negative prescription of five years, the quinquennium as it's known, does not apply to the obligation. Um, there are many statutory obligations to pay, to, to pay money which are not included in that list and many of these are discussed in the Scottish Law Commission's discussion paper and report. Just to give you some examples, the recipient of legal aid will come under an obligation to repay money to slab the Scottish Legal Aid Board if he or she is successful in legal proceedings. That's clearly a statutory obligation to make payment, but it is not included in Schedule 1, Paragraph 1 of the 1973 Act. A director engaged in wrongful trading will come under an obligation in terms of the Insolvency Act of 1986 to contribute to the company's assets. Uh, that, again, is a statutory obligation which is not included in Schedule 1, Paragraph 1 of the 1973 Act. So there are obvious omissions in the 1973 Act as currently set out. Um, and there's no principled reason why some of these obligations should be excluded. Uh, paragraph 1 does set out particular statutory obligations to make payment which are subject to 
to the short negative prescription, but there is no general catch-all provision at present in respect of statutory obligations to make payment. So this provision in Section 3 of the Bill, I think, will plug a lot of gaps it will also represent a considerable rationalisation of the law because at present there are certain statutory obligations under particular legislation stated in Schedule 1 um, and these can now be repealed if this general default position goes into the legislation. I think also this new uh, suggestion of, of having this catch-all, all statutory obligations to make payment will obviate the need for repeated updating of the legislation as new statutory schemes appear on the statute book. So I think it's very much to be welcomed. As far as the exceptions in paragraph two are concerned, I think the reasons for exempting certain obligations from the five-year prescription and making them subject instead to the 20-year prescription is um, a political matter. I don't personally have any problem with any of the exceptions stated in the bill, but as I say, I think they're essentially political decisions for the committee and for parliament. Okay, Dr Simpson. Yeah, um, again, I, I agree, and I have very little to add uh, to that. Um, I mean, I think that there is, it, it's, I think the Scottish Law Commission was correct to talk about limiting this to obligations to make payment, to statutory obligations to make payment out of the risk of catching a range of other obligations, perhaps owed by public bodies, um, that perhaps we wouldn't want to see caught. Uh, by, by this quinquennial prescription, by the five-year prescription. Um, I also think that the distinction that they draw in the report is broadly right. They say that, you know, broadly speaking, they're aiming to capture um, essentially private law obligations to make payment that are laid down in statute as opposed to public law. But I also think they've, they've got it right that it would be very difficult to state a test like that uh, in the legislation. And fundamentally, it's a political matter to determine on a case-by-case -case basis whether further obligations should be included in paragraph in paragraph two of Schedule One. Okay, um, Mr. Wedderburn, you. Uh, we don't really have uh, much to add to that, and it's not an area that exercised uh, the RIS. That's fine. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so the next question, Stuart McMillan, will take. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, it's uh, on uh, section five uh, of the the bill. Uh, certainly, the SLC consulted on four options for section five uh, uh, before deciding to use option three. Uh, and as a matter of policy, which option do you favour and why? And are there any drawbacks to uh, the option now set out in section five of the bill? And if you want to provide any examples, any specific types uh, of cases to illustrate your points, then that certainly would be very helpful. Red light. <laughs> There we are. Um, I'm happy to endorse the Scottish Law Commission's proposal and the approach adopted in the bill to go for option three. And uh, just for the benefit of all those present, I'm sure everyone's aware, but option three basically proposes to return the law to the pre-Morrison and ICL position, but add in a requirement of awareness or constructive awareness of the identity of the defender. Uh, I would wholeheartedly endorse that approach for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, there's the logical reason. Um, David Johnson, who's one of the commissioners behind the, the Commission's bill, um, notes in his book, he's a, undoubtedly the leading authority on prescription and limitation in Scotland, he points out quite rightly, I think, that there is something odd about saying that an obligation is enforceable before one knows against whom it can be enforced. So there's that logical argument, first of all. Secondly, I think there is a comparative argument. The third option is adopted by many jurisdictions across the world. It's adopted down south in England and Wales. It's adopted in France, Germany, New Zealand, South Africa. And although we needn't blindly follow what's happening in other jurisdictions, I think we can learn from what's happening in other jurisdictions. And we have to ask, why are these other jurisdictions, so many of them, adopting option three? And I think essentially it's on grounds of fairness, which leads me into the, the third point, um, that it isn't fair that time should run when, doesn't, when one does not know who is responsible for the act or omission. Um, Morrison, Morrison and ICL, I think undoubtedly is harsh on creditors, as to is the more recent decision in Gordon's trustees and Campbell Riddle. Um, another reason for my preference for option three is that it will reduce expense and administrative costs because at present 
um, creditors or pursuers are often forced to litigate against a multiplicity of defenders simply because they do not know which one is at fault. And I think this problem is particularly acute in the construction industry, where it might not be clear whether it is a construction defect or a design defect, which is the root of the problem. So you may well find that actions are raised against a panoply of defenders, main contractor, various subcontractors, designer, architect, engineer, surveyor, and all these people are put to the trouble, time and expense of having to investigate the claim against them, intimate the claim to their insurers, and there's an awful lot of wasted resource there. So I think um, option three is preferable on that ground too. Another point which I would like to raise is a matter of symmetry. In terms of the limitation provisions in the 1973 Act, um, and those are the provisions which apply to personal injury actions, the identity of the defender is one of the things of which the pursuer must be aware before time runs against him. So, for example, the victim of a hit-and-run accident, time won't run against him until he knows who was driving the car basically. And I think to introduce this requirement of awareness in terms of the prescription provisions will introduce an element of symmetry. So that a solicitor advising a client will know that regardless of whether he or she is dealing with the prescription provisions, well the short negative prescription provisions or the limitation provisions, awareness, actual or constructive, of the identity of the defender is going to be required. I think this is a fairer approach. Um, it certainly favours pursuers, but of course there is the additional element that it's also going to benefit all those people who potentially could be so sued at the moment where there is really no merit in the claim against them. A lot of people are being sued, like in these construction disputes that I mentioned, um, needlessly. Um, so that will avoid, this option three will avoid that happening. Um, as far as drawbacks are concerned, um, the obvious drawback is that the actual wrongdoer is going to be exposed to the risk of liability for a longer period. Um, but I think that's got to be looked at in the round. Um, this particular provision is going to favour pursuers or creditors, but there are other proposals in the bill which are going to favour defenders, and we have to look at the overall balance of fairness in the scheme as a whole. So, for all these reasons, I would support option three. Okay. Who, who, who wants to go there? Mr Wedderburn, you, you must have something to say well, on this. Well, yes. We, uh, the um, uh, architects, the RIS, were in favour of, of I, I t uh, the option three. Again, for certainty, to give a, uh, uh, the kind of people that are likely to be in, in the uh, uh, frame. And it not only does it then allow people to make provision, but it does mean that uh, the insurance industry, PII cover, is a little more certain, because uh, at the moment you have to, uh, insurance companies are, the risks associated with a potential claim are much broader and indeterminate. And I think this would allow, especially once an action is as commence and people have discovered who the uh, the identity of the re <clears throat> relevant people is, then other parts of the team can get on with their lives and they can notify their insurers, uh, which is a benefit. Okay, Dr. Simpson. Um, yes, again, I agree with option three, um, and I would just I would just add that um, I think um, Dr. Russell is absolutely right to draw attention to the fact that this is fair within the scheme of the bill as a whole, because of course what we're seeing in section 11, uh, 3 uh, as proposed to be amended is, is a sort of exception to the general, a sort of more general principle that um, you know, the, the, an obligation becomes enforceable, an obligation to pay damages becomes enforceable on the date when the loss, injury or damage occurred. And then what we see in 11.3 is an exception that's saying that knowledge is relevant where you know where the tests would be satisfied, the three the three limb test that the Scottish Law Commission um, proposes. Um, it's also worth mentioning and emphasising that creditors have to exercise reasonable diligence in acquiring, in, in trying, in whether we work out whether they've had this knowledge or not. So um, you know, in working out whether the 
it's not, we, we're not just asking, would the creditor have had knowledge that loss, injury or damage has occurred, loss, injury or damage was caused by a person's act or omission and the identity of the person. We're asking, did the creditor exercise reasonable diligence? Would someone who had exercised reasonable diligence have known these things? And that is what then causes the prescription to run in relation to obligations to pay damages. And it's quite a, in some ways, it's quite a limited exception to a, to a general rule that knowledge is not relevant across the board in prescription to start prescription running. And so I think it, 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 it provides an exception that, is, that respects fairness. Have you got any follow-ups on that, Mr McMillan? Um, just that, that it does take me into the kind of a, the, the, our next question. And just certainly the Faculty of Advocates, they expressed uh, concerns, including that the, uh, that the new wording might actually increase litigation. Uh, on the, the meaning uh, of uh, the words uh, in this particular amendment. And I just wondered, I mean, do you have any kind of thoughts on, uh, on the Faculty of Advocates' uh, concerns about this? No. Should we say what wording we're referring to? It's in sections 5, 2 and 3 of the bill um, to introduce uh, the drafting change uh, compared to the 1973 Act, uh, specifically with change reference to an act, neglect or default uh, by the defender to an act or a mission uh, of the defender. Yes, I, I'm aware that the, the Faculty of Advocates has expressed concern about this proposed change from the terminology act, neglect or default to act or omission, and um, that there's been some concern about how omissions might be interpreted. Um, but I think it's useful to point out that the terminology of act or omission is already found elsewhere in the Act. Um, it appears in relation to the limitation provisions, where in relation to personal injury, which I've referred to already, um, time runs from the date of injury, or in the case of a continuing act or omission from the date on which it ceased, the act or omission ceased. So this is not going to create any new problem. The courts are familiar with dealing with acts or omissions. Um, there are cases, just to name one, Kennedy and Steinberg, a medical negligence case, where what was at issue was an ongoing omission of a doctor to take a patient off a drug. So this is nothing new, this terminology, act or omission, and I think it would introduce a degree of symmetry and consistency across the prescription and limitation provisions. I, I do accept the courts are familiar with the terminology of act, neglect or default, but I think increasing consistency can only be a good thing. You're all, you're all nodding. Yeah. Can, I, yes. can I just put something to you? That, let, let's say you used um, Dr Russell, the example of the uh, uh, cases in the construction industry. So let's say, for example, um, Foundations are put, are put in; uh, they're not put in properly, uh, and some years later they start they start to sink, or it all goes wrong. That you you could argue that is neglect, but it might not be a, an omission, which in layman's terms is just b b forgetting to do something or just not doing something. Doing something wrong is different to an omission, is it not? I think that's something that the courts would just have to address on a case-by-case -case basis, to be honest. Okay. I don't know if any yes. of my other panellists have Certainly a Certainly when, uh, uh, as an inspecting architect, it's what you, you miss. That's regarded as neglect, but it is an omission to mm -hmm. see things and uh, uh, would easily be picked up by that wording. Yeah. That would be my feeling as well, that the wording is actually slightly broader, potentially, right. than the wording that we've seen in act, neglect, or default. So I think it would, I think it would catch that as what you're describing as being essentially an, an omission to observe proper yeah. standards. So legally it's not a, an issue? I don't think so. Okay. Mr McMillan? Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, <coughs> certainly, um, Dr Simpson, in your earlier comments, uh, you mentioned the uh, but the, the issue of the, the loss, injury or damage uh, has occurred and uh, this is something that was picked up uh, by the, the Law Society uh, in their submission. And, certainly, and the, the first requirement uh, in the, the test set out in Section 5 is that the loss, in, uh, loss, injury or damage has occurred and it's written submission. The Law Society identifies the potential uncertainty in relation to this 
requirement. In particular, it says that it's un it is unclear whether this requirement would be treated as satisfied uh, when there has been uh, expenditure on professional fees, but not at the same time uh, an awareness that uh, this con constituted a loss. It refers to the case of Gordon versus Campbell uh, in this regard. And, and do you agree that with the Law Society that, that this is a potential issue? And is there a need for greater clarity uh, on the face of the bill? I'm not convinced that there's a need for greater clarity on the, on the face of the bill, to be honest. The Scottish Law Commission has looked at the, um, the, the, the Gordon case. It did look at it before uh, the decision was handed down by the UK Supreme Court on the appeal, and it's expressly mentioned that it hasn't, the report expressly mentions that it, uh, it, it can't, couldn't take that into account. Um, the appeal, of course, um, upheld the decision of the extra division of the Court of Session for broadly the same reasons, and so on one level, you know, it does look like that the, it looks likely that the, the the problem will be dealt with, uh, as the Scottish Law Commission thought by the insertion of this wording. The only slight caveat I would um, add is that in the Gordon uh, against um, Campbell case, the the key questions. The, the, Obviously, we preserve the test that was used in that case, that loss, injury or damage has occurred. So that's the first thing. That, that is preserved in the uh, revised wording of subsection uh, 3A. Um, the key question, I think, then, if, if, if the case were to be decided again today, would be whether or not um, the trustees in that case, the pursuers who were making the, uh, the claim, had also the sufficient awareness that the loss, injury or damage was caused by a person's act or omission in late 2005 when the claim started to, to run. Um, I'm not sure how familiar members of the committee are with the facts, of the, the sort of detailed facts of the case, so if, if it would be helpful, I could say a little bit about that. But that's bri um, Briefly, that would be useful. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. So essentially, um, in um, this, this case... Um, what, what happened was a defective notice to quit certain agricultural land had been served on tenants. Um, and uh, the notice um, was served, um, I think, in November 2004, and the tenants then refused to get out in November 2005. Um, and um, it was argued that the trustees, the, the pursuers in this case, the trustees who, who owned the land that was tenanted, um, had knowledge um, of the loss uh, when they knew that the tenants would not voluntarily cede the fields, that the tenants wouldn't voluntarily hand over the fields. Now, what happened uh, next was that using different solicitors, and this is part of the important part of the case, the trustees, the pursuers in the case, then raised an action in the land court to try to get the tenants um, removed on the basis of the as it turned out, defective notices. And in 2008, the land court held that the notices couldn't be used. The notices were indeed defective. And then court proceedings commenced in May 2012. Now, you can see the importance of the question. If, the, um, if prescription started to run when the tenants refused to get out, in November 2005, then the five-year period would have elapsed by 2012. <coughs> but if prescription only started to run in 2008, when the land court handed down its decision that the notices were indeed defective, then there was still an opportunity to enforce the claim in 2012. So that was, that was the nub of the issue um, here. And the, 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 the problem um, was when did the trustees uh, be become aware that there was loss on the law as reformulated um, in, the, in the earlier, in the earlier um, decision. So um, the, the trustees um, became, it was held at all, at all levels of the decision, at first instance, the extra division of the inner house and then the UK Supreme Court held, the trustees became aware of the loss in 2005, okay? which meant that then it, it followed, that the, the claim had, had prescribed. But it was felt that this was rather potentially rather harsh because, um, you know, th they argued that they only became aware of the loss when the land court handed down its decision, that they had actually sustained loss when the land court handed down its decision to the effect that the tenants um, could not be removed on the basis of these defective notices. Um, so the, the question um, 
for the court was when did they become aware of loss. Now the question for the court would be when did they become aware of loss, when did they become aware that the loss, injury or damage was caused by a person's act or omission, and when did they become aware of the identity of the person. So there's extra barriers put in. Now on the facts of the case, the Scottish Law Commission believes, and I think there's good reason for believing, that um, the... Uh, the trustees would not have become aware that the loss, injury or damage was caused by a person's act or omission until 2008, or at least until a later period. Now, Lord Hodge is a little bit careful in his comments on this. Lord Hodge doesn't, he just says there is reform being considered by the Scottish Parliament. Lord Hodge has delivered the judgment in the UK Supreme Court. Um, I, I think that there is an argument to the effect that the second limb would have saved the trustees in Gordon against Riddle, but it's an argument. I think that um, one has to be conscious that uh, there, there was other evidence led in the case, and it might be argued on some of that evidence that the, the pursuers could have been aware that the loss, injury, or damage was caused by a person's act or omission, that they weren't just aware from 2005 that there was loss, but they might also have been aware from 2005 that it was caused by someone, um, and that someone, someone that they could identify. So it's, it's possible the pursuer might not have been saved in Gordon, but the extra tests improve the fairness of the law overall. And so I would still defend it, but I would be a little bit careful in just saying wholesale that the pursuer would have been saved. Probably he would have been, but as the SLC says, but just caveat it a little bit. Okay. Anyone else on this, or should we just... Dr Simpson's covered it very comprehensively. Uh, and uh, sitting in my final uh, area of questioning, uh, some of this has been uh, touched upon um, earlier. Uh, it's uh, in the written submission uh, from the Law Society, comments on the, uh, on the third part uh, of the new test uh, set out in Section 5, uh, namely that the pursuer uh, must know the identity of the defender or defenders. The Law Society makes two points. Uh, firstly, it says that uh, with complex contractual or corporate structures, uh, it can sometimes be difficult to identify the correct uh, defender and mistakes can be made. Uh, it questions whether the prescriptive period uh, would only start to run from the point uh, the correct defender is identified. Uh, but secondly, the Law Society raises the possibility that different prescriptive periods might run for different defenders uh, if the pursuer becomes aware uh, of the identity of one defender uh, before another. And do you wish to comment on uh, on both of these points? And uh, is there a need for greater clarity uh, about these issues on the face of the bill? Well, I would just say in relation to uh, a situation where you have more than one defender, co-debtors co effectively, I think it's a natural consequence of the reformulated wording um, in, in the bill, section five, that um, there is the possibility of separate prescriptive periods against you know, debtor one, debtor two, debtor three, um, according to when the awareness of the identity of that person became known actually or constructively to the creditor. So yes, I think clearly there is a possibility of um, dif a different terminus, a different starting date uh, in respect of the different obligations owed by each debtor. As far as the um, identifying the wrong defender is concerned, um, then obviously time isn't going to run in relation to the obligation owed by the, the right defender unless the constructive awareness provision could be engaged. Um, some reference was made to this earlier. If the creditor ought to have become aware of the correct uh, defender, the correct debtor, then time will start to run because awareness includes both actual awareness and constructive awareness. So if the correct defender ought to have been identified, time will run as long as that awareness could have been acquired by the use of reasonable diligence to which Dr Simpson has made reference already. Mr Wedderburn. I'd uh, just add that in the construction industry, with the multiplicity of subcontractors doing different things at different times, there is a great likelihood of there being different prescriptive periods and of only becoming aware later on of a particular actions of a particular sub-sub-subcontractor. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, of course. Yeah. If you had people <coughs> jointly and severally liable, then how would that work within? Um, you know, when you were identifying, you might identify them at different periods, but they could end up being jointly liable, could they? Presumably, um, you would, if you identified the defender who's jointly and severally liable, you would sue that defender, and then the rights of the the, um, uh, the sort of, if you like, the people who could have been co-defenders would um, then. I mean, I'd be very happy if the committee would like me to, to check on this further. But I would imagine that what would happen would be that their rights would then start to operate, as it were, their rights of recovery against the defender, um, and then they would. Uh, be subject to the same rules of prescription, so they would they would recover. Sorry, yeah. Even if they weren't perhaps involved in, in in the neglect, but they were just liable because they were financially linked. I think it would have to be. We, I'd need to, to think about the basis of their finan their liability. Then, if they're not, you know, if they're not liable because of of their neglect, perhaps we'd need to think further about the basis of their neglect in each individual case. I mean, I, I think the point about joint and several liability is extremely interesting. Um, I think it's, however, I, I think that it wouldn't, I don't think any of the provisions in the bill would be undermined by it, but it would be interesting to see exactly what the effects would be. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to speculate too much on that myself, um, but I'd be very happy to, uh, to look at that further if that would be. If you, want, if you want to write to us af afterwards yeah, yes, with that, your further, further yeah. thoughts, then yeah. feel free to do so. Okay. Um, David. Thank you, Good morning, panel. All my questions will be on Section 8 of the Bill and 20-year prescription. For obligation to pay damages, Section 8 of the Bill proposes a new start date for 20-year prescription. Can you explain whether or not you support Section 8 in policy terms and what the reasons are for your position? Shall I just pick on someone? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Russell. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to support the proposal in Section 8 of the bill. The purpose of the long negative prescription is to produce a long stop, which is designed to secure certainty and finality, so that at a certain stage, a potential defender can dispose of his files, he can dispense with his records and he can rest assured that he is no longer at risk of civil litigation. Um, our current rules on the long negative prescription and setting the starting date as at the date of loss are actually rather, that's quite unusual. Um, and it's quite unusual that the starting date, the terminus for the long negative prescription is the same as for the short negative prescription. More usually, you will find there is a difference. The proposal in the bill is obviously to take the starting date for the long negative prescription back to the date of the act to remission in question, which in most cases is going to be earlier. And quite often, particularly in construction matters, will be significantly earlier. Um, and I think in one of the previous evidence sessions, one of the, the witnesses spoke of, um, you know, uh, um, a situation where you may have a defective design leading to loss many, many years later, maybe 16 years later. Um, under the current law, the prescriptive period, the 20-year prescriptive period, will not start running until the date of loss, which will be 16 years after the date of the act to remission. The bill's proposal is to take the starting date for the long negative prescription back to the date of the act or omission. That um, obviously would mean that the designer in the um, hypothetical example I gave you would be free of the obligation sooner. Um, that might be considered to be harsh to the creditor, um, but I think one has to consider the overall scheme and fairness to all parties overall and the, the basic underlying rationale for the long negative prescription, which is to secure certainty and finality, that there must be a final cutoff period um, so that we're not having people sued 36, 37, 38 years down the line. But the RIAS are particularly pleased with this proposal because 
Uh, now I know personally of at least two or three examples. For example, one where a building was constructed in about 1981, and uh, either the architect or the contractor, we don't know from it, emitted some tanking, but the building was well drained round about and the, and the, the water table never raised. In 2015, it, we had terrible weather. It finally raised and, the, and it flooded. Now that, trying to track out the contractor had gone out of business and everyone had died, the architect equally, the, it, the, the owner had a, had a right, but it, he could never vindicate it and it was a kind of pointless right. So I feel having a, 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 a long stop that's a real long stop has a, a starting point and has a, a clear um, end point. I think the idea of not having interruption is another good idea. Uh, but again, to protect people that have commenced uh, proceedings before the end are still, their rights are still preserved, I think is the, uh, a good balance. Dr. Simpson. Um, I, thank you. I have very little to add to any of that other than to say I, I, I agree um, with um, what both my colleagues have said. And also, um, again, the underlying policy, both for this and for um, Section 7, which we may be going on to talk about, I don't know, but again, the, uh, the underlying policy that we need to have um, certainty and we need to deal with the situation where there's destruction of evidence uh, just necessarily it just happens after a certain period of time. It's important to have a long stop date and it's better to have a clear long stop date in the legislation. I think that they get the balance uh, right in the proposals and then the, the bill is correct. In that regard too. For Section 8 of the Bill, some concerns have been expressed by stakeholders, including the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates, about how it would work in relation to emissions to that and ongoing breaches. The SLC says in audio evidence to a committee that the language used in Section 8 would be familiar to a course from another part of the 1973 Act, and so it could not see any difficulty here. Do you wish to offer a view on this topic? Anyone want to offer a view? If you don't want to, you don't have to. I would just repeat what I said earlier, which is that the terminology of act or remission is familiar to the courts already. It already appears in section 17 of the Prescription and Limitation Scotland Act in relation to the limitation provisions, the triennium for personal injury actions. So it's nothing new, it's nothing with which the courts haven't previously grappled, and I'm sure they'll be able to deal with it adequately under this proposal. Okay, thank you. Want to move on to the next okay. question? The committee is aware of a parliamentary petition which provides an example of a situation where a 20-year prescription has operated harshly. The petitioner tried to sue a solicitor for defective conveyancing work, only to discover that the obligation to pay damages had been extinguished by a 20-year prescription. The new start date proposals in Section 8 will be earlier in some cases than the current law and never later. Is there a risk with Section 8 that we could see more harsh cases like this one? And if so, this affect the policy underpinning Section 8? How would this affect the policy underpinning Section 8? There are dangers, of course, around the long prescription. Um, and I think I'm not familiar with the case that you're mentioning, so obviously I should say that at the outset. Um, but um, I, I do think that ultimately in the interests of certainty, which, is the un which has to be the underlying policy of any regime of prescription. There has to be a, a cut-off point. There are real... Con I think the, the issue that you're raising um, is, is, the, is, the, is the issue that basically um, there was a, a, an error made in conveyancing at a very early stage um, and that this error hasn't been detected over the whole... over maybe 20 or 20 more, or more years... Um, well, in, in that case, this is one of the genuinely hard cases, I think, that's generated by any doctrine of prescription, and it's, 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 great, it's very regrettable. Um, but um, I think that in the interests of having certainty, which is a valid concern for the legal system as well, it is worth saying that has to, there just has to be a long stop, and that, that's just it. The case um, we're referring to is the, um, the case of uh, Mr Hugh Patterson. Right. Um, have you... Have you I'm afraid not. It no, doesn't ring any bells with you. 
I'm sorry, you're, no. you're nodding, Dr Russell. You've yes, I've, I've heard about Mr Patterson's yeah. petition. I don't know a great deal of detail about it, but I think the problem essentially was there was a problem with the conveyancing. Mr Patterson did not discover about this error until more than 20 years later. Yes. And because the issue of awareness is not relevant to the running of the long negative prescription, he has found himself on the wrong side, if you like, of the prescription provisions. Um, undoubtedly, we would all have sympathy for Mr Patterson, but... Um, it would simply have to be categorised as a hard case. And as we know, hard cases make bad law. Um, the, hope, the whole thinking behind the long negative prescription is that it should not be subject to um, personal matters affecting a particular uh, creditor. Um, and that's why um, the matters of threat, fraud and error don't apply in relation to the long negative prescription. That's why matters of legal disability don't stop the long negative prescription running. It is designed to be a long stop. I think wherever we draw the line, there will be hard cases, even if you were to return to the days of the 40-year long negative <laughs> prescription. Conceivably, you could still have people falling foul of that if they buy a house at age 25. There's a problem with the conveyancing. They don't sell it till they're 70. Well, they're still going to find themselves on the, the wrong side of the, the line. Um, and I think the interests of certainty, finality, have to prevail. That's the underlying rationale of the long negative prescription. It does represent a final determinate cutoff. And sadly, some people will find themselves at the wrong side of that line. So I guess, I guess the point is you, are, you either have no cut-off or you have a cut-off and you've just got to decide what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. And it is considered to be in the public interest, the wider public interest, that we do have finality yeah. in relation to the existence of obligations and that the courts shouldn't be clogged up with trying to um, deal with antiquated claims where all the evidence has been lost. Yeah and all the witnesses have died or forgotten what's going on. Yeah, this, this, this discussion has been, we've, we've had this discussion before within the Scottish legal tradition. That shouldn't constrain this debate, of course, in any way. But you know, it was fundamentally what motivated the introduction of ever uh, wider doctrines of uh, extinctive prescription was this issue around destruction of evidence over a period of time. Um, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure of that um, from some of my own my own work. Um, it's destruction of evidence is is key, and given that evidence is often lost over a long period of time, um, as as Dr. Russell rightly said, originally the period was set at 40 years. It's now been it was been reduced some time ago to 20 years. Um, again, where one sets the period, one could set the period at 21 years. One could set the period at 19 years. You know, it's it's but it's. Um, and I'm not suggesting that one should change the period at all for, for a moment, um, but there is a certain, there's a certain arbitrariness as to where one sets it. But I think the idea that there is a firm cut-off point is extremely important. OK, thank you very much. Um, Bill Bowen. Thank you, convener. I have two questions on interruptions and extensions to the 20-year prescription, Section 6. <coughs> section 6 of the bill says 20-year prescription will no longer be able to be interrupted but can be extended only to allow ongoing litigation or other proceedings to finish. Um, for the benefit of the record, uh, what are your views on this section of the bill? <clears throat> I wholeheartedly support um, the proposals in the bill. Um, I share the view of both the Law Society of Scotland and the Faculty of Advocates that interruptions to the long negative prescription by way of um, relevant claim or relevant acknowledgement should not be permissible. In my view, they are simply inconsistent with the concept of a long stop prescription. In relation to the possibility of extension, I think that does make sense if someone were to raise proceedings 19 years down the line. Um, clearly, such a person has not abandoned his right. Prescription is often referred to as being the abandonment of rights. If somebody is currently in the process of litigation, he's clearly not abandoning or sleeping on his rights. And I think it's only correct that the proceedings should be allowed to finish. Again, um, I very happy to support. The, I would just agree with everything that Dr. Russell's um, uh, said as regards the, the need um, for 
uh, the introduction of this. Again, it's a long stop. Again, the, the under, to be consistent with the underlying policy, which is to induce to, to bring about certainty. I think this is sound. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, I would agree also, and make further point in relation to professional indemnity insurance that you have a, a period as a as a retiring architect, you can then know which ones are at risk and when they'll uh, expire and therefore arrange uh, runoff cover. Okay. Uh, thank you. The, the second um, question. In its response to the SLC discussion paper, Brodie said that the 20-year period should still be able to be interrupted but should restart, not from the beginning but from where it left off in the first place. As the only alternative mentioned by stakeholders to Section 6 of the Bill other than the current law, do you like to comment on that suggestion? Yes, I believe that Brodie's concern was that rights might prescribe during litigation, and obviously that's now been dealt with by the extension provision, the, the only situation where the long negative prescription can be extended is to allow existing proceedings to come to a conclusion. And my understanding is that Brodie's are now content with what appears in the bill. Yeah, same. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, move on to a uh, question about section seven. Um, that says that the 20 year prescription, which applies to certain property rights, will no longer be able to be interrupted, but can be extended only to allow ongoing litigation to finish. Um, although this mirrors the approach in section six for personal rights, the faculty has suggested that the approach in section seven would not work well for property rights like servitudes. Um, so do you agree with that? And if so, are there any alternative approaches which might work better? Dr. Simpson's thinking about that one. Thinking about it, um, and um, I should say that I've, um, I haven't read all of the faculty's commentary on this at the outset, so... Um, with, uh, with respect to that, it, 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 you know, what I'm saying is not informed by that commentary. However, um, again, um, I was very happy with this, and I, I'm aware that, of course, servitude rights, um, right, like you know, sort of rights of rights of access, constituted by one property in favour of another, um, are, uh, are are subject to the long extinctive prescription, and I wouldn't. As I can't as such see a problem with that under these provisions. I'm very happy that, again, it should be subject to this long stop, again, for the sake of certainty. Um, again, um, if the um, committee wanted me to look at, again, if I'm contacting any way about um, joint and several liability, I'd be very happy in an email to write a comment relating to that, if that would help, given yeah. that I'm not familiar with the faculty's commentary. No, that's, that, that's that fair regard. enough, yeah. Mr. Wedderburn, any uh, thoughts on that one? No, nothing to add. No, oh, I thought you might have done. Uh, <laughs> and Dr. Russell? Well, I have read what the Faculty of Advocates has said here um, and what um, Mr. Howey said in his evidence session before the committee. And I have to agree with what was said, and in particular what was said in the written submission, which the faculty um, then submitted. It does seem anomalous that if somebody litigates about a right of servitude, a right of servitude which that person hasn't um, actually exercised for 19 years, that it should prescribe after the 20-year period has elapsed in conclusion of the... Um, proceedings and I think that's something which could usefully be revisited. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got some questions on standstill agreements um, which are in section 13. Um, when the SLC pr proposed the general possibility of being able to contract out of prescription they got a mixed response. Um, so section 13 of the bill contains a narrower proposal which would allow a single extension to the five-year period via a one-year standstill agreement. Section 13 also says that a contract to remove or shorten a statutory period of prescription would be invalid. So are the proposals in Section 13 of the Bill, including permitting one-year standstill agreements, something you can support? And it would be helpful if you could explain the reasons for your views. 
who wants to go there? Right, Dr Russell. Yes, I'm happy to support the proposal that standstill agreements be permitted. I think they will help to facilitate investigation and settlement of claims, and obviously it's in everyone's best interest to avoid the need for an adversarial litigation. Um, there is obviously the fear that such agreements could be abused and used as a delaying tactic in essence. And so for that reason, I think that the very important safeguards inserted in the bill uh, should be there. In other words, a standstill agreement or a, you know, a, a, an agreement to, to delay um, the running of the prescriptive period um, can't be entered into in advance. It, must, it can only be entered into once the prescriptive period has started to run. In other words, once a dispute has arisen, um, it should be subject to a time limit. One year is proposed in the bill, and I would support that. That seems reasonable to me, and it should be possible um, to, to utilise this provision only once. I would agree with what the Faculty of Advocates has said, that such agreements, there should be a requirement that they are entered into in writing. I think that's a very sensible proposal and one which I would endorse. Um, so I think, yes, there is a place for standstill agreements, but we do have to be careful that they're not abused. Yeah. And I think that the safeguards are in the bill and to prevent course, that. Because it's an agreement, both sides have to agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Dr Simpson? Yeah. I also agree with that last caveat about the agreement being in writing. Right. I think that makes an awful lot of sense. Um, but again, I have no, I have no problem with um, these um, standstill agreements. I think it's quite clear from the Scots Law Commission report that um, there, there's, there's the possibility that people may try to achieve this end through various devices anyway in practice. And what this is doing is providing a mechanism whereby this is definitely possible and therefore it promotes legal certainty. And so again, I would endorse um, this approach quite happily. Okay. Yes, uh, so would I, uh, that especially in the construction industry, there's often contracts of unequal power and there is, a, I like the safeguards here, because if you had it without the safeguards, the powerful part of the contract would set in and, and start extending the prescriptive period without uh, restrictions. So I think these safeguards uh, uh, lead to fairness. Can you explain that a bit further? Uh, ye yes, that um, uh, because uh, you can only start it once, uh, you can only consider entering into them once there is uh, a dispute in in place, then you can't set it up in your original contract. And because it's uh, only uh, one year, it can't be, ex and it can only be done once, you can't have it being extended, which would be another temptation for the more powerful contracting party. Okay, thank you. Um, right, a question on uh, section 14 of the bill, which would introduce an explicit statement in legislation that when there is a question about whether a right or obligation has been extinguished by prescription, the burden of proof lies with the pursuer. Uh, what are your views on this proposed change? Dr Russell again. Yes, I'm very happy to endorse this proposal. Um, the current law is uncertain and there are conflicting dicta as to whether the pursuer or defender bears the burden of proof. So, for example, in relation to, um, well, in the case of Strathclyde Regional Council in Fairhurst, the court said the defender bears the burden or onus of proof, whereas there are other cases, um, such as Pelagic Freezing and Lovey Construction and Richardson and Quercus, where the court took a different view and said that actually the pursuer bears the burden of proof. So there is some uncertainty, and it is perhaps surprising that the 1973 Act didn't address this issue and make specific provision on it. And I think the Court of Session judges have actually said that was a, a somewhat surprising omission, that it wasn't uh, um, provided for in the 73 Act. Um, sometimes it's said that the person who makes an affirmative statement uh, bears the onus of proof, but that is problematic because obviously it would depend on how pleadings were framed. So a pursuer could say, uh, my right subsists, which is obviously an affirmative statement, but a pursuer could equally say, your obligation to me has not prescribed, which is a negative statement. So that 
proposition takes us no further forward. So I think we do need statutory um, clarification of where the burden rests. Um, I think the, the proposal in the bill is to place it on the creditor, and it's important that that terminology of creditor is used rather than the terminology of um, pursuer, because obviously the question of onus of proof could arise in a counterclaim, and in a counterclaim the creditor is obviously going to be the defender in the main action. So that's why um, the bill says that the, the burden of proof should rest on the creditor. And um, I would endorse that proposal. I think it makes perfect sense. And I would not um, suggest or endorse any suggestion that the um, burden should vary depending on whether you're dealing with a two-year prescriptive period, five-year prescriptive period, 10-year prescriptive period, or 20-year prescriptive period. I think a uniform approach should be taken. And I think the approach taken in the bill is eminently sensible. Okay. Yeah, um, I I, uh, I completely agree um, that the um, it's very important that we have some clarity on this. Um, the Scottish Law Commission set out options one, two, and three. The burden should be on the creditor, or the debtor, or switch. You know, but we, you know the first the first step is we we definitely need some clarity, and I think this is an excellent opportunity to provide that. Um, as regards where the burden of proof should lie, um, I also think that it, while while I, I respected the view and I could see some merit to the view that there's, there should be a, a, a switch, which was one of the respondents, I am not for the reasons given by Dr. Russell, I'm not not convinced of it. Um, what my my when I saw this, I was originally. Um, unsure as to whether the burden should be on the pursuer or the defender, I'll be honest. Um, and I, I found some of the reasoning that Morton Fraser gave in their response to the Scottish Law Commission discussion paper quite interesting in that regard. They commented, it seems unfair that a defender should be allowed to assert a defence that an action is prescribed and then sit back and leave the pursuer to prove that this is not the case. Of course, the language of creditor and debtor does to some extent help to 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 address that. Um, certainly, um, the matter uh, is clearly clearly become a, a bit of a moot point um, in the in the courts, and um, I think probably um, the, the the senators of the College of Justice came down to the view that one or two or three needs to be implemented. Um, I, on balance. I'm not terribly sure whether I would go with option one or two, but there's a preponderance of opinion in favour of option one um, now. Okay. So yes, I a little to add, uh, other than that I think it's, it's essential to have some clarity which the Act brings, and choosing the, the creditor uh, is as, as, as an appropriate person for okay. the burden of proof. All right. Do me members have any other questions? No. Um, any other witnesses? Um, do you have anything else you wish to add that we may not have covered? Yes, Dr. Russell. Yes, I would just like to point out that um, the bill proposes a reformulation of the fraud and error provision in section 64A of the 1973 Act. And I think it might have been appropriate for the bill also to address the issue of section 64B of the 1973 Act, which relates to legal disability. Legal disability um, has the effect of stopping the short negative prescription from running, um, but it has no impact on the running of the long negative prescription. And legal disability is defined in the Act in section 15, subsection 1, as non-age and unsoundness of mind. Now, you'll probably be aware that the Scottish Law Commission um, produced a discussion paper on personal injury um, limitation and prescribed claims in 2006, which was then followed by a report in 2007. And the Scottish Law Commission at that time was highly critical of the terminology of unsoundness of mind um, and took the view that it was very outdated language. Uh, the Scottish Government then conducted a consultation process and it agreed with what the Scottish Law Commission had said about this being an outdated um, type of terminology and that the terminology unsoundness of mind was potentially insulting. 
I would endorse that, and I think the opportunity could have been taken here to update the language along the lines which had previously been proposed by the Scottish Law Commission to the effect that a uh, legal disability be defined as somebody who is incapable within the terms of the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act of 2000. I do think that in Scotland in 2018, we shouldn't have language like unsoundness of mind appearing in statutory provisions. And I think um, the opportunity could have been taken here just to tidy that up, given that we're also seeing you know, slight changes to definition in terms of relevant claim to include claims in um, receivership and administration, you know, an updating here would have been appropriate, I think. I'd certainly be happy to agree it's worth revisiting the language. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, yes sir. Changing the language actually change the meaning or the impact of that clause? Um, it's just, it's, the, the term unsoundness of mind, I think, is just considered to be insulting and offensive and I don't think it has any place in, in this day and age. It would be the other way that you, you, you said. Yes, I mean there is there is um, section one six of the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act um, I think would be a much more useful test to use. Is it a different test is really what I'm getting at? Would it change it's no it's really a change of language. Language. I think the language that's currently employed in the Act is is frankly insulting and offensive. No, well, it certainly has the potential to cause offence. No. Right. Okay. Sorry, what, what was the new wording you were suggesting? Um, somebody being incapable within the terms of Section 1, Subsection 6 of the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000. That proposal does appear in the 2007 um, report of the Scottish Law Commission. Okay. That's, that's it's, right. just, it's just... Um, it's a matter of terminology rather than yeah. a matter of substance to take up Mr Bowman's point. The terminology is just not appropriate, I think, in the okay. modern world. No, that's fine. That's, uh, that's, that's very useful. I mean, we're, we're here to uh, consider potential uh, amendments, so that's, that's our job, and that's what you're here for, is to, to help us with that. Um, so any, any further comments or questions? No? Um, well, can I thank you all for your time I, th I think it's been a very very interesting uh, session um can also thank you for the uh, sort of language reviews which has been easy to follow i think and and some of the uh, examples you've used have been very useful as well um so i'll suspend the session to uh, allow you to leave and thank you once again <laughs>